Well, a federal judge in Washington, D.C. has found Donald Trump guilty by implication of inciting the insurrection on January 6th and leading his followers to violently attack the Capitol. Judge Colleen Kalar Cotelli found that Danian McKendrew, guilty of participating in the insurrection after McAndrew waived her right to a jury trial and submitted to a trial in which the judge was, in effect, judge and jury. The judge issued her findings of fact and verdict yesterday, saying, in committing her crimes at the Capitol, the defendant, quote, followed then-President Trump's instructions. After finding the defendant guilty on all four of the nonviolent charges, the judge wrote this. Denine McAndrew knew on January 6, 2021, that her actions at the Capitol were unlawful every step of the way, from the western boundary of the Capitol grounds to the West Lawn, to the Upper West Terrace, to the interior of the Capitol itself. She saw sign after sign that her presence was unlawful. Nevertheless, Heeding the call of former President Trump, she continued onwards to stop the steal. For her participation in the insurrection of January 6th, the court finds Denine McAndrew guilty on counts one, two, three, and four. Heeding the call of the former president. That is exactly how the January 6th committee described what the attackers of the Capitol were doing on January 6th. The judge said that this defendant, quote, followed then President Trump's instructions. That is exactly what the hundreds of pages of the January 6th committee's report proves beyond a reasonable doubt and was proved beyond a reasonable doubt to a federal judge in Washington, D.C. in the case of one of the attackers of the Capitol. And other judges in Washington have been finding the same thing with other defendants. This judge's finding of fact is an 18-page, double-spaced, micro-version of the January 6th report. The January 6th committee says that the mob attacking the Capitol did it because Donald Trump wanted them to, and federal judges in Washington, D.C., who are handling the hundreds of criminal cases that have reached a verdict, have found the same thing. Trump's instructions that's what they are calling it, Trump's instructions. The January 6th attack on the Capitol was done on Trump's instructions. In his introduction to the New Yorker's edition of the January 6th committee's report, New Yorker editor David Remnick says, historians will feast on these pages. David Remnick highlights in his introduction what the January 6th committee found Donald Trump was doing and thinking during the attack on the Capitol. Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows is quoted by Cassidy Hutchinson saying, he doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. During the attack on the Capitol, Donald Trump's White House Chief of Staff said Donald Trump didn't think the attackers were doing anything wrong. And another proof that the attackers were acting on Trump's instructions is right there in Donald Trump's reaction to it. David Remnick's highlights of the committee's evidence, he highlights the committee's evidence about why why Donald Trump was doing nothing. Trump's passivity was not passivity at all. As Adam Kinzinger put it, President Trump did not fail to act. He chose not to act. Liz Cheney was no less blunt. He refused to defend our nation and our Constitution. No congressional committee in history has done more important work than the January 6th committee and the committee's reward for that work in the new Republican-controlled House of Representatives is to be disbanded. Knowing that the Soviet-style impulses of the new Republican majority in the House of Representatives would want to erase the very existence of the January 6th Committee from congressional history, the January 6th Committee managed to get its full report into print and all of its evidence handed over to the Justice Department before the Republicans took over the House of Representatives. And now, the Republicans are busy degrading the remaining committees in the House of Representatives. Speaker Kevin McCarthy laughed at the idea of giving pathological liar George Santos any serious committee assignments. 
And so now we know which committees Kevin McCarthy thinks are the laughable jokes of the House of Representatives because Kevin McCarthy has assigned George Santos to be a member of the Small Business Committee and to be a member of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Don't let any Republican member of the House of Representatives tell you that they care about small business when they are all supporting the placement of someone on the Small Business Committee who has lied about everything in his life, including his name. Today's newly exposed George Santos lie is about his mother. It's actually worse than that. It's about his mother and 9-11. And just in case you thought there was some limit to Republican lying, this single lie by George Santos proves there is not. George Santos is not the first Republican to lie about 9-11. Donald Trump lied about 9-11 while he was running for office for the first time. How did he Dr. keep us Trump. safe when the World Trade Center came down? The world, excuse me, I lost hundreds of friends. As soon as Donald Trump said that, I tweeted that that was a lie. He did not lose hundreds of friends on 9-11. And the next day, Donald Trump changed that lie to many, many friends. And I immediately tweeted again that Donald Trump was lying about having lost many friends on 9-11. And then something happened that has never happened to any other Donald Trump lie. Donald Trump never, ever told that lie again. He never again mentioned losing a single friend on 9-11 because he didn't lose a single friend. The truth is Donald Trump lost zero friends on 9-11. There were 1,800 9-11 funerals in and around New York. Donald Trump did not attend a single one. But Donald Trump did not lie about his mother on 9-11. If you thought lying about their mothers might be off limits for Republicans, George Santos is here to explain to you that you are wrong. George Santos claims that his mother escaped from the South Tower of the World Trade Center on 9-11. Immigration records obtained by NBC News show that George Santos' mother, Fatima DeVolder, applied for a visa to enter the United States in 2003, two years after 9-11, stating under oath that she had not been in the United States since 1999. Republicans in the House of Representatives have no intention of putting George Santos under oath about his mother or 9-11 or trying to get some honest answers out of him about anything about his life, including where he got the $700,000 that he personally contributed to his own campaign. Republicans in the House of Representatives plan to use their investigative powers on various committees to put other people under oath, all of whom are likely to be Democrats. Florida Republican Congressman Matt Gates, who personally forced Kevin McCarthy to go through 15 ballots to win his speakership in the most humiliating way, has been awarded a seat on the Judiciary Committee as a reward for torturing Kevin McCarthy in the voting for speaker. And that is yet another indicator that Kevin McCarthy is the weakest speaker of the House in history. The rewards of his speakership are going to the people who caused him the most problems in trying to get to his speakership. You couldn't ask for a greater sign of weakness in Kevin McCarthy than that. Congressman Matt Gates, who has been the subject of a Justice Department investigation himself, will now have jurisdiction over the Justice Department. According to testimony to the January 6th committee, Matt Gates asked for a pardon from Donald Trump. He's not the only pardon seeker who will be serving on the Judiciary Committee. The new Republican chairman of the committee, Jim Jordan, was also asking about pardons from Donald Trump. Another pardon seeker who will be serving on the Judiciary Committee is Arizona Congressman Andy Biggs. But the Committee on Oversight and Accountability, which has jurisdiction to launch investigations of almost any aspect of government, will also be populated by Republican pardon seekers who tried to overthrow the last election and tried to prevent Kevin McCarthy from becoming Speaker. Congressman Paul Gozar, Congressman Scott Perry, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, and Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene will all be members of the Oversight Committee. Marjorie Taylor Greene has also been given a seat 
on the Homeland Security Committee. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gozar were removed from committees for their conduct during the last Congress. With Marjorie Taylor Greene serving on the Homeland Security Committee, we now have a member of Congress who was removed from her committees in the last Congress for violent, racist, and anti-Semitic rhetoric serving on the Homeland Security Committee. Marjorie Taylor Greene spread lies about school shootings being staged. She supported all of Donald Trump's lies about the 2020 presidential election. She voted to overturn the presidential election after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, as did all of the insurrectionist Republicans I have just mentioned, except for George Santos, because he was not yet a member of Congress on January 6th. But he was in Washington on January 6th as a private citizen supporting Donald Trump's attempt to overturn the election that day. The 139 Republicans in the House of Representatives who voted to overturn the presidential election on January 6th after the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol represented the inside job of the insurrection. And now the insurrectionists are in charge of the House of Representatives where they will accomplish exactly nothing. That's the good news. They might continue to try to pass bills like abolishing the Internal Revenue Service as they're promising to do, which will be completely meaningless exercises because none of the legislation passed in the House of Representatives by Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans will ever come to a vote in the United States Senate. They will conduct investigations in the House, but their investigations will be ineffectual circus affairs we have seen them conduct before. They most definitely will not be investigating what Donald Trump said today about the classified documents that he refused to hand over when the FBI asked for them politely and then were found by the FBI with a search warrant. Today, Donald Trump said, these were just ordinary inexpensive folders with various words printed on them, but they were a cool keepsake. There he is saying that he deliberately kept them as a cool keepsake. He's lying, of course, about the documents. Court documents, court records have revealed the exact number of classified documents found in those folders and outside of those folders, including in Donald Trump's desk. The number of actual classified documents found in Donald Trump's possession after he left the presidency is over 300. In his introduction to the January 6th report, David Remnick writes, Congress is now populated with dozens of election deniers and many more who still dare not defy Trump. The stakes could not be higher. If you are reaching for optimism and despair is not an option. The existence and the depth of the committee's project represents a kind of hope it represents an insistence on truth and democratic principle. Um. This is a much delayed report because since I returned from the Christmas break, I have been trying to find the time in the show to update you on the KIND Fund, Kids in Need of Desks, the partnership I created with MSNBC and UNICEF to provide desks to schools in Malawi where the children have never seen desks at some of those schools and to provide scholarships for girls to attend high school in Malawi, where public high school is not free. Many of you use the KIND Fund for people on your holiday gift list, and many more of you did that this year than ever before, giving desks in the name of people on your gift list or a scholarship with UNICEF, then sending them an acknowledgement of your gift. Your contributions set a record this year, and I hope but I have time tomorrow night to get into more detail about what your record-setting contributions have achieved. Jafet Samdoka is a nine-year-old boy whose school received desks for the first time this year in November. Uniform, 
uniform wa tusida and my desk and it and is a kuti didzire mbabu no bwino komaso kuti ndisama ponyese bolemba ndikutoko zaka ndipande kuti mwaripa sa my desk ma ponzira watu apitirire abrize be kutandiza ana ambiri malawi Joyce Chuzali is a student you met on this program after I met her in 2016 at her high school, which she was able to attend thanks to your kindness in contributing to scholarships for girls to attend high school in Malawi. She told me then she wanted to be a doctor and a poet and spontaneously recited a poem that she'd written then called Little by Little, which I know many of you remember as a moving declaration of her determination to reach her goals. <clears throat> Joyce Chisale is in medical school now, <clears throat> and she sent us a video greeting that I hope we will have time to share with you tomorrow night. For tonight, I just wanted to say thank you for your holiday contributions and some of the future doctors and nurses and teachers of Malawi want to thank you too. <laughs> Zigo <laughs> <laughs>